Well, for those folk who are not able to join with us live this morning and are listening to this audio or seeing this video presentation after the time, thank you for joining with us. Thank you for taking the time to hear what we have to teach you out of God's word this morning. For those folk who are online with us, it is really great to have you join with us. And we're going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We've been considering the book of Ephesians chapter 6 these last few weeks, and we're going to continue in this light as we con continue to look at Ephesians chapter 6, particularly from verse 12 through to verse 18 this morning. This is our theme verse. Uh, chapter and verses that we're taking, and I'm going to read them again, and each week we're going to just expound a little on each of these things, and we've looked at a couple of things in the previous weeks. I brought my notes here from last week. We, we, we've we looked at being strong in the Lord. We've looked at trusting in God's defenses, and this morning we're going to look at standing on the promises of God, standing on God's promises. Let's have a look at Ephesians 6 verse 12 to 18. <clears throat> Ephesians 6 verse 12 to 18 for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Father God, as we come around your word and consider your word to our, to our hearts and minds today, Lord, may you teach us what you would have us to know through your Holy Spirit living within each and every one of us as believers, as we take your word, as we believe it, and as we trust it, and has, as we allow it to work within the very depths of our soul and mind. We thank you for this. We thank you for the fact that you have preserved your word for us, that we can read it today and trust it, and know it is absolute truth. In Christ Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Right, so as we consider Ephesians chapter 6, and we look at a couple of things here this morning, the, the particular section that I want us to look at is, and you'll see I've highlighted it in your notes, it's, and having done all to stand. Something about standing, and then Paul goes on in verse 14, says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. There's something about this standing that Paul speaks of, and that's what I want us to look at today, and when, hence the title, Standing on God's Promise. So go with me to Romans chapter 1. Let's just have a look at a couple of verses here. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1.16, and I'm going to give you time to get there. It is important. The scriptures say that we must preach the word. We must teach the word, not my words, the word, God's word. That is why we encourage you to take your Bibles, turn with us, and look at these scriptures, because I know that the formula that God has put in place is that his word, the words that you read in the book, the Bible, preserved for you, will work within you way more than anything I could ever say. And that is why we give you all these scriptures time and time again. Mark them. Note them. Consider them again through the week. Have them do the work. Have God's word do the work. And as you trust it, as you believe it, I know that that will happen. How do I know that? I know it works within my life like that. I know this to be true. I believe it with all my heart. And that is why we give you scripture upon scripture, week upon week. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. Paul writes and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, that's the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith now notice Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That word gospel means good news. He's not ashamed of the good news of Christ, the gospel of Christ, even though he knew that he would face a lot of uphill and a lot of chastisement and a, 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 a lot of persecution because of what he was going to be doing and preaching and teaching as God had revealed this to him. But notice he quotes scripture himself. He says in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That's what he says by inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. And then he says, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You can write next to that verse. We're not going to turn there. Habakkuk 2.4. Paul quotes the book of Habakkuk. Paul, God chose Saul of Tarsus, who became known as Paul. Paul the Apostle is the same man as Saul of Tarsus, who was a Jew, a religious Jew, who knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand, yet was blinded just like the rest of the nation of Israel to see the coming Messiah. And because he knew the Old Testament scriptures, God, I believe, used Paul in this particular way so that he could bring not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. Saul, a Hebrew name, Paul, a Gentile name. Saul of Tarsus quoting scripture here because he's talking and he's saying to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek there is the Gentiles. So he brings in scripture and you can just imagine his audience being Jew and Gentile. They would say, yes, that's true. That is what God's word says. And they, therefore he uses God's word to bring in and to, and to solidify what he is actually teaching. Have a look with me at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Now the book of Hebrews is written specifically and particularly to the nation of Israel, to the Hebrews, to the little flock that will be going through the time of tribulation. We can read and, and, and see from this today and, and learn things from the scriptures, from the whole of scripture. But we know and understand that particularly the writings of Paul the Apostle, the 13 books that he wrote, are particularly written to us today. But the whole of Scripture needs to be understood, read, believed, and trusted so that we can understand the context within which Paul the Apostle is writing. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, when he says, Paul says in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the just shall live by faith. Well, let's, let's let the Bible define faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Your faith, my faith, cannot rest in an organization, cannot rest in a, a preacher, a teacher, a priest, it cannot rest in anything other than God's word. God, the Holy Spirit that lives within each and every believer does not work outside of the word of God. God, the Holy Spirit uses the word that was written and inspired by God, the Holy Spirit to bring us today to this understanding so that when you reading God's word as a Christian as a believer in Christ Jesus and what makes you a Christian let me just stop and say what makes you a Christian is what Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 so hold your hand keep a place in Hebrews 11 we're going to come back there let's just have a look when you and I as Christians what makes us a Christian 1 Corinthians chapter 15 a lot of folks say to me, how do I know, how do I know that I am definitely saved? How do I know if I'm believing the right thing? Because there's so many folks that would be taught, have and have been taught so many different things. No, you have to do this, then you have to go there, then you must say this, then you must do this prayer, then you must do that. What makes us a believer? What makes us saved? Well, what makes us a believer is our faith in something 
But what makes us a Christian is our faith in the word of God. And God's word defines what it is to be a Christian. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now notice, Paul saying, remember Romans 1, 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Here he's defining it. I declare unto you the gospel. Well, pray, Paul, tell us, what is this gospel? Which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand. There's that word again, stand. I'm standing. What does it mean if I'm standing? Am I walking? Am I no, I'm standing. I'm standing firm in something. I'm believing it by faith. Hebrews 1.11, I'm believing it. I'm trusting it wherein ye stand by which also you are saved so if you this is a gospel that if you believe and trust this gospel paul's saying and you rest and stand in that you saved verse 2 let's go again verse 2 but which all by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what i preached unto you unless you have believed in vain so paul's going to just remind them listen this is this is the gospel here it is here it comes for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins, first thing, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, secondly, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Three things. So here we go. Paul is defining the gospel. He's defining the gospel and saying, right. So he received this message, this gospel, how that Christ died for our sins. So if you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary for your sins, that's the first part. And he was buried. And that the third day he rose again, as Paul defines it here in 1 Corinthians 15, 4. If you believe and you trust that. Nothing else. You believe and you trust it and you stand in that. And if you kept your hand in Hebrews 11, one, go back, go to Hebrews 11, one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So you look at the scripture. Were you present at, did you see Christ dying on the cross at Calvary? Was, was there any video footage? Was there anything taken? No. What, did it happen? Yes. How do we know? God has caused it to be written down and to be preserved for us today that we, by faith, we read and we see scriptures like 1 Corinthians 15. We read, we believe that, we trust it. And by the way, when Paul says in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15, according to the scriptures, well, that's the prophecies. We've been looking at the prophecies in the week in, in the, the study sessions, and we're going to continue looking at that on Tuesday and Wednesday. Isaiah 53, predicted. And prophesied Christ's coming to earth and the fact that he would that he would die. And the book of Psalms, Psalm 22, Psalm 69, all of these Old Testament scriptures that speak to the fact that Christ was going to come. And when he came, he was fulfilling that. And the nation of Israel could look at those scriptures, as they should have, and said, this is he. So Paul is reminding them here. And then when he says, verse 4, and he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You can write next to that verse, Hosea, Hosea um, 6.2. So Paul, once again, referring to scripture, and the Bible says that Paul reasoned with the Jews. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And he said, remember this, this, and this? This is who Christ was. So that's why when you and I come around a time like this, and we take God's word. We, by faith, are reading God's word. We trust it. We believe it. It is the evidence God has preserved for us. And then we stand in that. We stand firm. We believe it. That's what makes us saved. Let's have a look at this standing firm. Go with me to Psalm 89. Psalm 89 Turn with me to Psalm 89. Let's, I'm gonna, we're going to run a couple of scriptures here on standing firm. I just want you to, I want the scripture to, to show you. What is it when we stand firm? Well, I can tell you as I'm, as I'm talking to you this morning and I'm looking out of the windows of my house, man, the wind is blowing. And uh, 
you know what the beautiful thing is? I'm inside the house. I, I hear it. Maybe you can hear this door behind me rattling a little bit. Maybe you can, maybe in your house, you've got a couple of uh, things rattling because of the wind. If you're in Port Elizabeth, if you're not, well, but do you, do you see my hair blowing? Do you see anything happening? No, the wind is out there. I, I can stand here protected by the house that I'm in. And folks, the idea Paul is trying to get around here is that you and I stand firm in the promise of God that when the storms of life come, they will buffet us. But your salvation is firm. No matter what happens, you cannot, cannot be taken out of the hold of Almighty God. That should bring you to a place of, of, of comfort and of courage, despite the circumstances, dealing with folks in the week and hearing of their challenges and having lost loved ones, dealing with illnesses, going into hospital and having to undergo surgery, facing the challenges. And now with the, the COVID-19, all the additional things that have to happen. How many times haven't I heard people's operations have been put on hold because of what's happening? All these additional stresses that, that seem to be happening. Folks, it, it, from a business perspective, facing the financial challenges and, and, and just trying to, to grapple and get through this. And yet God's word says we can stand firm. How? Certainly not in our own human ability. It has to be through the promise of Almighty God. So go with me now to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. We're going to run some verses here and... Um, I've put these verses in, in a way that we, we can actually, we're going to page, we're going to start in Psalm 89, and then we're going to move our way, way forward. So go with me to Psalm 89, page with me to Psalm 89, and we are going to look at verse 3. Now, this is a psalm of Ethan the Ezraite, and uh, so I just want you to get this. It's a psalm concerning uh, the nation of Israel and the covenant and the promise God made with David. We're not going to be going down talking about that so much as what I want you to see is this standing firm. This, uh, this idea of, of being able to stand firm and standing in the promise of God. Psalm 89 verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Now, go with me to verse 26. We're not going to run the whole of Psalm 89, but verse 26 of Psalm 89. He shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Notice the rock of my salvation. Go with me to verse 28. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. My covenant shall stand fast with him. So God says through the Holy Scriptures that his, his covenant is going to stand fast. Now, if you have a look at the nation of Israel right now, they, they, are, they are certainly not um, in any position where they could be saying, you know, there's no, God has sorted out, we don't have any issues. The nation of Israel is as much part of the lost Gentile world today as you and I are. And the way that a Jew gets saved today is the same way you and I as Gentiles get saved. And that is by faith, trusting in that Christ died on the cross of Calvary for us and was buried and rose again to give us new life. Every single human being alive today needs to know that message. They needed to know that since Paul's day, but I'm talking about, it's you and I, it's what we can bring forth and bring to people's understanding. The more I see what is happening in the world, the more I am driven to want to make sure that I can tell as many people of this message. And the, the things that I see that could make one really just get absolutely angry, 
I channel that and ask the Lord through his word that we bring it to a place that that energy is channeled into me following what God's word says and to preach and teach the word. I'm going to show you this now. So go with me to Psalm 111. Psalm 111. Psalm 111, verse 7. Psalm 111, verse 7. I'm trying to go a bit slower so that you can keep up with me. I know that sometimes I get a bit ahead of myself and I'm purposefully keeping this slower so that you can turn with me. The good thing for the folks that are watching this after the event is they can stop and pause and turn this and to, to a scripture and then start it again. But for those folk who are live with us now, I'm giving you enough time to turn there. Turn with me and to Psalm 111 verse 7. Let's read this together. The works of his hands are verity, that word verity is truth, and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. How long is God's promises going to stand? Forever and ever. And are done in truth and uprightness. He sent, we'll go to verse 9 now, he sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. God's name is holy and reverend. No man, God. But the point I want you to see is that standing forever and ever. So when Paul writes and he says, stand fast. This is the kind of thing that we need to be considering. So let's go and look at some of Paul's writings now. So page forward with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And verse 13. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Watch ye. Now, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. Now, this church was a church that was certainly not living out what Paul believed they should be doing as believers. And he chastises them. If you read the book of 1 Corinthians, you will see he certainly gets them to understand that what they were doing was not one of charity and it was not one of God's word working in and through them. They were, they were certainly involved with their own prideful, sinful things. He says, watch ye. Now the word ye there means you, the believers at Corinth and by implication us today, watch ye therefore and stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong powerful verse let me watch ye so paul's saying watch be watchful be mindful keep watch see what's happening uh we have a camera at, at, at our house for those folk who have, have been around you will know we have a camera that points to the front of our house so that um if some folks come to um visit my wife she works from home and now also me working from home here, yeah, we can see on the camera if someone comes and something happened to the camera system and uh, it, was, it was out of action for a few days. And one really gets to understand the, the benefit of a camera system when it's not there. And what was happening is I'd say to my wife, I'm sure there's someone outside. I, 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 heard, I, I heard the bell because it's... It, it, on the on the garage where where they need to ring it and then we'd go and normally our dog would warn us and sometimes there'd be someone there ringing the bell and we wouldn't have seen it and i'd have to come in and, and then look out the window and and try and see and oh yes okay and then go outside watching being mindful watching now the camera system's fixed it's up and running i i, I can just look at and i can immediately see what's happening outside Watch ye there. Be careful. Keep watch, Paul saying. Stand fast. But notice what he says in, please get this. He doesn't say stand fast in your faith. He says stand fast in the faith. Now, what is he saying? 
Stand fast in the faith. The faith of what? The faith of the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand fast in the faith of the gospel. The gospel that Paul says he's not ashamed of. The gospel that he says in 1 Corinthians 15, which he declares to us what is the gospel. You, you trust that. It's not the amount of faith you and I have. The amount of faith you and I have is not going to save us. It is our trust, our faith in the faith. You know why? Because it's the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews says, for the joy that was set before him, Christ Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. You see, we stand because Christ has done the work. We rest in what he has done. Then he says, quit you like me. Now that word quit, today in the English um, language, you say, well, I quit. That's the, the mindset that we have. The word quit there means, oh, I'll give up. That's not what that old English word means. It means finish. Finish. Finish you like men. Be strong. In other words, stand. Stand. Watch, stand, stand fast in what? The faith. Quit you like men. Finish like men. Every day, every day, we wake up. We need to be mindful of this armor that Paul is talking about. And as we go through, we're going to stand, we're going to see how can we stand? Because you know what? The armor can be trusted. The armor is what gets trusted. Stand ye fast in the faith, quit ye like men. And then he says, be strong. By the way, when Paul says, be strong, he also writes and says, when I am weak, then I'm strong. The strength there is the strength of you trusting in the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The strength of you trusting in God's word, not your own strength. Galatians chapter five, Galatians chapter five, you in first Corinthians, just page on and you'll get to Galatians chapter five, first Corinthians, second Corinthians, Galatians chapter five. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture on this stand fast, but it's, it is important to get this. Mark these. Go and read them through this week. Galatians 5 verse 1. Now notice carefully. Stand fast, therefore. Here's that word again. Stand fast. Notice. <laughs> You're standing, folks. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. That's where Paul says, watch ye. Stand fast, in, stand fast in the faith. This is it here. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Who's made us free? Christ has made us free. How? By our faith in what he did. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't get all mixed up and tangled of the yoke of bondage. What yoke of bondage? You know, when you... And you're no longer standing and you're trying to think you think that you can do some work now to actually get saved behold i paul say unto you that if ye be circumcised christ shall profit you nothing talking to the 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 the, the, the believers here saying you know what because if you think now you've got to go and get circumcised like some of the jewish folks were saying you know no 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 yes okay you can believe and trust in christ but you know what you've also got to get circumcised Paul says, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that he's circumcised, that he's a debtor to do the whole law. Paul saying, all right, so if you're going to believe what, the, what these Jewish folk are saying and saying, listen, you need to be circumcised as well as, yes, you need to believe in Jesus, but now you need to go and be circumcised. Paul saying, you know what, then you must go and actually apply the whole law. Then, then it's no longer standing and resting in the promise of God. Now you must just go out and go and do your own thing. That, it's either that or you're going to stand and rest. Now there is a Christian walk we have, but our walk is as a result of our standing. And this is what I'm trying to get our minds focused on this morning. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. How many times... Have you heard that term, fallen from grace? And it's been used to talk about somebody who is supposedly a Christian, 
in the person's eye. Yeah, and I'm supposed to be a Christian. And look at them. They've fallen from grace. Look, they've sinned again. They've fallen from grace. The scripture defines falling from grace as trying to do work to justify yourself. Folks, let the Bible define what falling from grace means. Paul the Apostle writes and he says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now that we know that doesn't give us a license to go out and sin. But you cannot fall from grace by your sin. The more you sin, the more of God's grace you need. Falling from grace is when you go out and you stop standing and you start thinking that I'm going to go and work for my salvation. I'm going to go and do this work. That's not what Paul is, is, is indicating here. Verse 5, for we through the Spirit, notice that's a capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, wait for the hope of the righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Resting and standing in the faithfulness of Christ and what he accomplished. Philippians chapter 1, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit. Now, that's not standing fast in the Holy Spirit, that's standing fast in one spirit. Being collective, being together, we're standing fast in, we, we're united in, in thinking and in, in, this, in the spirit of thinking here with, with, within us. That you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What is that? Standing on the promises of God, standing on his promise that by faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be justified. Stand fast. Be united in that. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. That word terrified means alarmed. Which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Folks, as believers, you're going to face some persecution when, you, when you're talking to people and, and folks come and they want to talk to you and tell you about well, how you should be saved. And you come with a message and saying, you know what, I'm standing on the promise of God. I'm resting in the scripture. I'm trusting in what God has declared for me as a believer that if I believe that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, was buried and rose again, if I believe and I trust that as all sufficient payment to almighty God for my sin. I believe that I'm a saved person and I'm going to rest in that. I'm going to stand in that. I'm going to take God's word. I'm going to trust God's word and I'm going to allow God's word to work in and through me so that my life reflects who I am in Christ. When you make that stand, you are going to face some persecution. You are going to face some ridicule. You may even lose some friends. My question is, were they really friends? That is going to happen. Verse 30, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Philippians 4, verse 1. Philippians 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown. So stand fast, here we go, in the Lord. My dearly beloved. Notice how as you see all of these scriptures, I hope you're getting the picture that Paul is painting here. It's standing fast in the Lord, standing fast in the faith, standing fast in the gospel, believing and trusting. And when the winds and storms of life come, that you can stand. How's that going to be possible? Well, God has given us some armor. We're going to continue looking at that, this armor that's going to help us stand. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 now. One last thing on this stand fast. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. I beg your pardon. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit and belief of the truth. So how are you chosen by God? When you trust the gospel. Then you become part of God's chosen. God did not pick some who he's going to save and others who he's not. God, through the pen of the apostle Paul, says God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Every single man, every single, and that's mankind, to be saved. So how are you saved? You are saved through sanctification of the Spirit, that is God the Holy Spirit, that indwells the believer and sanctifies you, declares you holy, and gives you a right standing in Christ. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. Notice, how did God call? Through the gospel. You hear the gospel, you trust the gospel, you believe the gospel, you get saved. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our apostle. And the traditions there, that's not church tradition. That's the traditions that Paul and the other apostles at that time, the, 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 who were teaching the grace message, were teaching and saying, what we're we teaching you. Because remember, the word of God had not been completed. He says, you stand on that. He says, our epistle, well, what you're getting, the Thessalonians were getting this letter. And remember that the letters were being copied out and sent to the various churches. And they were getting this and they were reading this and they were believing that. And, and Paul saying, stand fast. Don't let go. Quit ye like men. How are we going to do this? Well, let's briefly have a look at this. And then we'll, we'll bring this to a close and pick it up next week again. Take unto you the whole armor of God. Now, I, I do apologize. There's a typo. Um, there, I did not pick that up. That's a, I said Ephesians 13 and 14. Well, you know, we're looking at Ephesians chapter six. It's Ephesians chapter six, verse 13 and 14. So let's just, let's just have a look there. Ephesians chapter six, verse 13 and 14. I do apologize for, I know that there's some folk who like to mark the readings beforehand. My apologies. It's Ephesians six. Maybe you've worked this out already that it was Ephesians six, 13 to 14. Well done if you did that. Wherefore, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, so there is truth that we have to believe and trust which is the truth we get from God's word today. Then it says, take unto you the whole armor of God. Now, Ephesians 1, 3 says, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The idea that Paul is getting here is he is not saying, let me tell you what he's not saying. What he's not saying is that every single day you wake up, you've got to come and say, right, okay, Lord, give me that armor. Lord, I'm coming to you in prayer now. Just give me that armor. Folks, you have the armor. You have the armor that Paul's talking about here. But he says, take unto you. You know what that is? That's being conscious of it. That's being conscious of it. That's taking unto you. That's, that's family members who are in a house being conscious of one another. You can be in the same house, but you mulling around so busy. No, everybody's coming and going and nobody really is, is paying attention to one another. Or you take unto you your family members. Hi, how are you? Speak to one another. And here, when it says, take unto you the whole armor of God, I believe what Paul the Apostle is saying here is that you need to be conscious on a daily basis of this armor that you have. It is a re constant reminder. When I wake up in the morning, I get up. It is every morning. I thank the Lord for the day. Thank the Lord for another day of grace. And then I consciously thank him for the armor that I have. So that I, I take unto myself that armor, which means I remind myself through praying to the Lord, 
bringing into remembrance of what I have and who I am in Christ. It's almost, I was chatting to somebody the other day and I said, it's almost like when sometimes when you shut your computer down and I'm, I, maybe I'm, this is a bad example because I'm not really a computer buff, but when you shut your computer down and you start it up again, all of a sudden the stuff that you did, maybe you didn't save the setting in the right way and it's gone to the default setting and then you have to reset everything up again. It's a kind of thing of sometimes we, when we bombarded with the things of life, our flesh, our minds almost default back to the negative, default back to what's going on around us, default back when we, when with the folks that I deal with the previous day, wake up in the next morning, sometimes those thoughts are there and I'm, I'm concerned about this person, that person, and, and it's a reminder for me at the start of every day, there's not a single day that I don't start and do that. Well, let me say there have been days that I've got up and had to rush out because something's happened or whatever the case may be. And, and, and it's like you, something's missing. Oh, Lord, let me just stop. Let me just focus on your word. Let me just focus on you. And when Paul says, take unto you the armor of God, I hope that, I hope I'm making sense to you here, folks, because it is, it is so important that you get this because it is, it's your armor. It's your protection. It's what's going to guard your mind. Your soul and spirit is guarded. It's protected. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. But you and I live in a fleshly carnal body that defaults back, that has had years of input from all the negativity that, we, that just floods back into us. And if we don't consciously on a daily basis, uh, my, this, is, this is my understanding of what the scriptures are teaching. And if, 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 if you disagree, that's fine. But this is my understanding that on a daily basis, we need to take unto ourselves the armor. We need to remind ourselves, hey, this is who I am. This is what I have. You've got it. It's not now going and saying, okay, Lord, I better, oh, Lord, you didn't give me enough armor today. No, no. You've got all the armor that you need. You've got the living God living within you. You've got God, the Holy Spirit, living within you. It's being reminded and mindful of that. And that's what Paul the Apostle is talking about here. Go with me to Romans chapter 13. We're going to draw this to a close. We're going to end on this point, taking unto us the whole armor. Romans chapter 13. Just have a look here with me. Romans chapter 13. I'm trying to go slower and give you enough time to turn to these scriptures. And I do know that it's going to take us a little longer maybe to get through some of these things. But it, it is absolutely vital that you get this. Romans 13, verse 12. Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Uh, I, I love it when, when it talks about God's word being a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Put on the armor of light. Folks, don't let the enemy keep you in darkness. Don't let the enemy keep you and get your mind to be focused on all the negativity that is out there. It is there. You need to deal with it. You need to deal with the challenges. I appreciate that. It's not that you stick your head in the sand and forget about it, but it's that when you walk out there and you walk out to see what is happening and how you're going to face these challenges, that you walk out consciously knowing that your standing cannot be affected. Let us walk honestly. There's our, that's our walk. That is our daily living, not to be right with God, but the fact that we have been made right. We have a standing. That's who we are in Christ. And our daily walk is the life that we now live on a daily basis and allowing the life of Christ to live out. It says, let us walk honestly in the day, not rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on, notice, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I ask you again. Do you need to on a daily basis say, Lord, please come into my life? No, that's not what the scriptures teach. The scriptures teach that you have God, the Holy Spirit living within you. And the Lord Jesus Christ has made it very clear that God, the Father, God, the Son, that's Christ and God, the Holy Spirit are one God, 
three distinctive persons, one God. And if you have God, the Holy Spirit living within you, you have Christ living within you. You have God, the father living within you. And then why does Paul say, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ? Why? Christ is within you. So how do you put him on? Be mindful that he is with you. Be mindful and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Notice Paul doesn't say that when you become a believer, by the way, that the lusts of your flesh are going to disappear. I, I, I'm sure there's not a single person listening to me live or who's look, watching this recording afterwards that can say that when they became a believer, the lust of the flesh just disappeared. It's there. So therefore we put on Christ. We are mindful of a daily basis. How do we do that? through the reading of God's word, through prayer, coming and praying in accordance with the way Paul the apostle would have us to pray. And how is that? Well, knowing and thanking God that you are blessed with all spiritual blessings, that you have God the Holy Spirit living within you, and that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. And that you pray, as Paul says, that he's learned with whatever state he finds himself there with to be content. I hope this is getting to the very depths of, of your mind this morning. Go, one final verse and I'm going to end. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. And we're going to look at verse 17. The flesh. Oh, wait, let me leave. Let me stop. <laughs> Going too quick there. Galatians 5, 17. Are we there? Oh, I long for the day that I can look across the congregation and see the folks paging to the scriptures. At this point, I've got to imagine that in my mind's eye and, and uh, imagine and looking at you and being able to look at you. Well, I'm looking at you this morning and I can't see who you look, all are there. I can only see myself. I look at, I look at you, but I see myself. Oh, scary thought. But listen to what Paul says, Galatians 5, verse 17. For the flesh, that's our carnal, the, the, the carnality of who we are, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. And notice, that's a capital S. Our flesh lusts against God the Holy Spirit. How's that so? Well, because the, the default program is for us to go after those fleshly desires and the Spirit against the flesh. So God's spirit is working against that. Our flesh works against God's spirit. How, how does that happen? Well, the more of God's word you have within your soul, the more the spirit, the Holy Spirit, will help you overcome those desires and lusts of the flesh. That's why it's so important to get the word of God and to program your mind through the reading of God's word and have God's word work within you. The spirit of God cannot help you against the lust of the flesh unless you are giving the spirit of God the very power that he, that he requires to help you. And that is for you to read the word. So you say by grace through faith, through trusting in the gospel, but then there's work we do. And the work is not to get us saved. The work is to bring us to a, a point of understanding. And we're going to pick that up next week as we know how to withstand in the evil day. But let me just end with this. And the, it says, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one, one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Oh, how many times hasn't that happened? We want to do this way. But we, get, we get sucked in and drawn in. And then afterwards, oh, why did I not? Why didn't I? Why didn't I just... Wait a moment. Why, why did I speak so soon? Why did I do that? Why didn't I just wait? That's it there. That's what Paul's talking about. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Well, it's things that you would want to do because you know through God's word what is right. But if ye be led by the spirit, ye are not under the law. Folks, you're not under the law. You're under grace. But be led by the spirit. I'm going to go to verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And Paul goes down and lists them. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. You say, oh, I haven't done those things. Hatred. Huh. Variances, emulations, wrath, strife. Have you strived with someone? Seditions, heresies, envies, envied something, murders, drunkenness, rev uh, rev uh, revelings, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, in time past, this is who you do. That is what, what you do. 
That's what you did. But you're a saved person now. And these things should not be happening in your life, but do they? Absolutely. Does it make you unsaved? No. It's the flesh lusting against the spirit. Folks, stand. Stand firm in who God has made you through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That the moment you trusted that, that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for you, was buried and rose again, and you believed and trusted that to pay for your sin and to bring you to that justification, that right standing with God, God the Holy Spirit sealed you and put you into Christ. Now, allow the life of Christ to live in and through you. Take the word of God and bring that into your life so that you can withstand, and we're going to look at that, withstanding in the evil day. Don't miss that. Next week, we'll consider that. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for your word that has been given to us, preserved for us, that we can read, believe, and trust. And as we consider this this morning, Lord, may your word do the effectual work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.